Jaron Jarvis Channel, Top 20 Scary Stories of the Day from Reddit No Sleep. 2018-09-20. Story 1, Please Board the Windows. Isn't it interesting how people can share their fears? When I was little, my aunt used to have a room filled with porcelain dolls. For years I slept in this room and never had any problems, but then one day my cousin told me that she could never sleep in that room because the dolls crept her out. I could never sleep in that room again. I'm not really afraid of dolls anymore, but there is another fear I contracted as a kid that's stuck with me up through now, Windows. I was over at my friend Ronnie's house for a sleepover birthday party, and, like at all sleepovers, we stayed up late goofing off before falling asleep. Ronnie had an older stepbrother, Reggie, who decided to join in on the party. In retrospect, Reggie was kind of a weird guy, but he was older than we were so we all thought he was pretty cool, though Ronnie didn't like him much. Anyway, we were trying to tell scary stories, but we all sucked at it, we kept acting scared, but really we were just having a good time trying to tell stories. Then it was Reggie's turn this isn't really a story, Reggie began. It's just something that happens sometimes. The entire room fell wrapped and still. Reggie continued our houses don't really protect us. Things come and go all the time. Usually, it's just bugs, like spiders and stuff. Sometimes little animals get in, like my saw slugs. But really anything can get in. In Florida sometimes people come home and find alligators in their houses. Even as a kid I had heard all of this before, but it was uncomfortable to think about. I was scared of spiders and slugs and I didn't want to think about them crawling into my room at home. Reggie's story was creeping me out sometimes, people come in. This was the moment that ruined me. This was the moment I felt that deep sense of dread seep in through the hairs on my back and into my spine. I can trace it all back to Ronnie, and his sleepover, and Reggie's stupid story just like the bugs and animals, sometimes people just come into your house. They crawl into your basement and hide there for a little bit. Sometimes they peek through the cracks in the basement door and watch you and your mom and dad walking around. But it's not just the basement. At night, sometimes people come into your house and rummage through your kitchen. They want food, and if they can't find any they like, they leave and peek into the bedrooms to see if there's any tasty snacks in there. Every one of us was completely still. The story was bad enough, but Reggie was starting to get a little weird. As he went on, it seemed like he was losing track of what he was saying. He stared past the group, at the bedroom door behind us and his words became a drone that seemed more mindless than anything. I wanted the scary stories to be over, I just wanted to go to sleep most people lock their doors, so people can't get in that way. Instead they crawl in through the windows. Before they come in they'll get up close to the window and look around in the room to see if someone's there. That's why sometimes, if you turn around really quickly, you'll catch a glimpse of someone's face in the window, looking in at you. I felt something warm in my underwear, I'd peed my pants for the first time in years, which was enough to break the spell. Ronnie's mom yelled at Reggie for scaring us, and she gave me a pair of Ronnie's underwear to wear, but I wasn't able to sleep, or look at the windows, for the rest of the night. In fact, for the next six months I slept in my parents' bed, even though I was much too old to do so, and I insisted on covering up my windows when I finally moved back to my own room. I was always afraid that if I looked out, I'd see someone standing there, staring back at me. A few months ago I got my first real job, and it was time I finally moved away from home. I packed my bags and headed to Denver, Colorado to try to find a place to live before my start date. I found an ad on Craigslist for a house to rent that seemed like a good deal, but not such a good deal that it seemed too good to be true. Ranch style home with lots of natural light. The ad bragged. Very private. The pictures looked great online, so I scheduled a viewing. The landlord was a scraggly middle-aged woman who was so aloof that I first thought I'd gone to the wrong address. She told me that she actually lived in Arizona, but her property manager had quit right after the previous tenant broke their lease. She moved back into her house in Colorado but wanted to find a tenant quickly so she could get back to her family in Arizona. 
The house was indeed beautiful, but I started to feel uneasy at the large number of windows installed throughout the home. Every room had, at minimum, two glass doors to the outside, and most rooms had an extra large pane window for additional viewing. I had just come from several years of dorm rooms and basement apartments, so I hadn't needed to confront my minor phobia until now any chance we could board up the windows. I had meant it to sound like a joke, but it came out with the tones of a serious request you to, huh? She sighed. I was expecting more resistance since my request was ridiculous, but I guess someone else before me had asked for the same thing. The last tenant asked about that too. No, we can't board up the windows. I was just kidding my embarrassment covered up the fact that I absolutely would have boarded up those windows, had I been allowed. I signed the lease and moved in just a few days later. I was relieved to finally have my own place, but as night approached I felt dread take over like I had not felt in years. At first I casually strung up some sheets in front of the larger windows, but as sunset approached I found myself quickening my pace as the anxiety set in. Tape, garbage bags, anything would do, so long as I could cover all of the windows before sundown. I made sure all the doors and windows were locked, and then, huddled with blankets on my bed, I waited. I knew right away that the night would pass slowly and sleeplessly. The first sounds came from my bedroom window. A light tapping followed by a couple almost imperceptible thuds. Something or someone was testing the glass to see if it would give. As the minutes crawled by, I waited in terror as the scratches and taps traveled the perimeter of the house from one window to the next. Like a dentist probing for cavities, the would-be intruder tested every corner and crevice of the windows, looking for any vulnerability that would let it in. Finally, it reached the front door. At first it started with the usual picking and prodding, but then I heard a faint screeching, like metal being dragged along the glass. The scrapes were short and infrequent, like they were trying to avoid making too much noise, but they persisted for several minutes. Then, finally, the noises were gone, and I felt some brief relief, until my phone rang seconds later. I'd stayed tense and still for hours so I didn't dare move now to pick up the phone. It rang, went silent, and then notified me that I had a voicemail. Very, very slowly I reached for my phone, unlocked it, and listened to the voicemail. It was my landlord hey, sorry to call so late at night, but I forgot to tell you something and it was bothering me. I did some painting right before you moved in and you probably don't want to be breathing in those fumes all night. You should probably crack a window or something before going to bed. Anyway, you're probably asleep already, but I just wanted to let you know. There was no way that was a coincidence, no way my landlord just so happened to call and ask me to open a window as soon as the intruder gave up. I knew I wasn't safe. My fear boiled over as I thought back on everything I had gone through. Why had the previous tenant asked to block the windows? Why did the landlord travel all the way back from Arizona just to lease this house? Why did she call in the middle of the night, right when the noises stopped? Why was Reggie looking at the door when he told his story? I needed to leave. I needed to get far, far away from this goddamn house. I clutched every last scrap of courage inside me and ran for the back door, which led out to the patio. I unlocked the door and ripped it open, bounding out through the patio into the neighbor's backyard, and out to the bordering street. I pointed myself toward the local downtown and ran, desperately fleeing whatever was looking for me at the house. Eventually I felt just barely safe enough to stop and fill my heaving lungs, surrounded by empty city streets. I was safe, I felt, now that I was in a somewhat public space. After a moment to reflect, I pulled out my phone and bought a plane ticket back home. Then I called a taxi service and took myself to the airport, never to visit this place again. I reached home, manic and paranoid. I needed to talk to Reggie. I needed to know what he was thinking of when he told that story. I didn't know how to find him, but I was able to find Ronnie's address through my high school class's alum directory. I hadn't slept since what happened in Colorado, but I needed to resolve this, so I left to visit him right away. The house at the address listed seemed like it may have been abandoned, 
The windows were boarded up and there was no car in the driveway. I tried the front door but it was stuck, or locked, it was hard to tell. Still, I was desperate, and with a bit of effort I managed to climb up over the garage and get access to a window on the second floor. I tried to look inside but this window was boarded too. In the end, I decided to pry it open and step inside. I needed to know if Ronnie lived here. The inside of the house was dusty, but it didn't seem abandoned. The room I'd entered seemed like a study, garnished with some chairs and a few bookshelves. I slowly crept away from the window, and as I approached the doorway I heard a faint sound coming from inside the house. Following my ear, I made my way down the hallway and approached a room with a closed door. The sound grew more descript, now clearly a whimper. I leaned forward and set my ear to the door leave me alone. Leave me alone. Stupid Reggie go away. Please stop please stop. Stupid Reggie. I leaned down to peek through the crack at the bottom of the doorway. Through the slit I could see a man, very young, sitting on the floor. He had his knees to his chest and was holding his head in his hands, rocking back and forth stupid Reggie, leave me alone. Though I hadn't seen him in years, I could tell this was Ronnie. What a relief. I'd finally found him. And here he was, nestled so cozily in this house where there were no windows because he'd covered them all up. I felt a connection to him just then, realizing that we'd been living the same nightmare all this time. I wanted to talk to him, but he seemed like he didn't want to be bothered, so I slowly left his room to wait in the rest of the house. I'm still waiting to talk to him. Sometimes he stops whimpering and I approach his room, but he starts again when I get close. Sometimes I watch him through the crack in his door, because seeing him so scared makes me feel a little better about how I handle it. But also it's nice to have him here, because I'm less scared when I'm not alone. People come by and drop groceries by his front door, so I bring them in for him. I eat some, because I need food too, but I always leave the good stuff for Ronnie. He must know I'm here, because I think he's caught me looking at him beneath the door once or twice, so he knows I'm taking care of him. Recently, though, Ronnie's been sleeping a lot. He must have stayed awake for a long time like I did so he needs a lot of sleep. In fact I haven't heard him whimpering for over a day now. That's good. I'll watch him until he wakes up. Story 2, Mommy, please don't turn off the lights. I live in a quiet suburb about 15 minutes from my state's capital city. My husband often travels on work-related trips, so usually it's just me and our daughter at home during the week. My daughter's name for privacy purposes will be named Anna. It's her middle name, anyway. Dot strange things have been happening since we moved into our house five years ago when Anna was born. Clothes disappear, doors lock when we know we haven't locked them, showers will turn on at random moments, lights go on and off in parts of the house, toilets will flush at all hours of the day and night, even when Anna and my husband are all in the same bed, etc. Harmless things. Dot me and my husband would joke every time company would come over and the lights would flicker in the room, oh it's just that darn ghost. Dot I'm done joking. Last night, the most terrifying thing happened to me. My husband is on a business trip, and I was home alone with Anna. We had had a normal evening. I cooked pan-seared chicken, baked potatoes and asparagus, then played with Anna and her Barbie dolls. She fell asleep on the couch watching Disney Junior cartoons around 8.15, so I picked her up, carried her to her bed, and tucked her in with a kiss on her forehead. I sighed contently as I turned on her nightlight and tiptoed out of her room, ready to go watch something that didn't involve a song about remembering to wash your hands. Dot as I settled down to watch Shark Tank, or some other programming, I honestly can't remember at this point, I heard Anna giggling. Thinking she was playing with her toys or something, I stood up to go tell her to go to sleep, and marched towards her room. I heard her voice and the tinkling of her laugh float out of the room, and it sounded like she was having a conversation with someone. What made me stop before I reached her room was that instead of her answering herself, like a child would when playing by oneself, it was like she was waiting for another person to answer, and then answering them. Dot I brushed it off as a five-year-old's imagination, I pushed the door open, closed it behind me, and said sweetie? Whatcha doin'? 
I wish I hadn't asked. I'm talking to my friend. Anna said, smiling. She was sitting up in her bed. I glanced around the dimly lit room. What friend? I said. I wish I hadn't asked. Anna seemed a bit confused. She pointed to the edge of her bed, the boy. Right there. There was no boy. I forced her smile and said go to sleep, honey. It's late. I turned to leave the room. Mommy. I turned back around yes. Anna's facial expression had fallen into a look of concern. My friend says don't go out there. Why did he say that? I asked, for the sole purpose of amusing her he said the bad lady is out there. What bad lady? I asked, now concerned myself. The bad lady's not nice. My friend says she might hurt you. She looked very scared. I went and crouched by the edge of her bed. We're perfectly safe, baby. No bad lady lives here. Yes she does. Anna whispered, tears forming in her eyes. I could see she was obviously upset, but my patience was wearing thin. There was no boy and there was no bad lady. I hugged her and stood up turn the lights on, please, mommy. She half sobbed. I sighed, and flicked the lights on see? I told her, gesturing around the room nobody's here but us. Anna looked up at me with her big brown eyes. There is, mommy. She insisted, tears streaming down her cheeks. No there isn't, Anna. I said quite more stern than I intended, but this was beginning to be too much. She looked at me, tears still flowing, and began to plead with me to stay with her. Exasperated I agreed, with the plan of waiting for her to fall asleep and then quietly creeping back into the living room. I stood up to turn the lights off and Anna burst out sobbing in a tantrum Mommy please don't turn off the lights. Please don't. Please don't. Don't, don't, don't. She hollered, the bad lady will get us like she got Robbie. She'll get us. Her screaming scared me more than her warnings of the bad lady. I had no idea who Robbie was, but at that point I didn't care. I simply left the lights on, crawled into bed with her, and waited for the sobbing to cease. I drifted off after that, and woke up around 6am to Anna asleep next to me. I groggily got up and walked through the open bedroom door. I didn't open it last night. I assumed Anna had gotten up to get a glass of water or use the bathroom during the night and had left the door open. I shuffled into the bathroom and glanced in the mirror. My face. Dot my face was cut and bruised on the left cheek. I lifted my arm to touch it and noticed my arm. It was cut and bruised also. I looked at my other arm. Same thing. I lifted up my shirt to reveal cuts and bruises and scratches all over my torso. I was so confused. None of it was bleeding, but it hurt like hell. I hadn't even noticed the burning until I saw myself. I rushed back into Anna's room and grabbed her, checking her all over. She awoke with a shock and began to rub her eyes. Nothing was wrong with her. No cut or scrapes or scratches or bruises. She was perfectly fine. Mommy what happened to your face? She questioned, with that same concerned look on her face. My face felt hot. Nothing, sweetie. I just fell down. Okay. She said, and laid her head back on the pillow. Dot I began to walk back to the bathroom to examine the extensiveness of my injuries and to ponder how I got them when I noticed the outside of Anna's bedroom door, the wood was shredded and scratched up. I have a feeling that her friend didn't do that. Dot. Story 3, I work at a nursing home. Before the story starts, I want to say that English is not my native language and I'm not a writer of any sort. This story is true, believe it or not. My name is Sam, I'm a 28 years old Swede and I work with the elderly. I got no education within the field as I got the job on a whim after I quit my last one as an electrician. Over the past 5 years I have been at the nursing home I have seen people get hurt by falling, stabbing, mentally ill, and die from natural causes. The nursing home is divided into 4 sections, A to D. I work in the B section of the house on the first floor. The rooms were numbered B101, greater than B112, and this story is about rooms B106, B110 and B111. 
So let's start by telling you who lives where. I will use fake names for the elderly since two of them are still alive. In room B106 lives a man. Let's call this man Sven. Sven has dementia and is a doctor. Sven has always been saying that he sees people in his room, telling us that they are there to hurt him. Everything from old colleague to nuns. In B110 that's Ernest. Ernest doesn't go outside his room a lot. We're rarely allowed to go into him outside of medicine time. Fully clear in the mind and got ESBL bacteria. B111 is Lilmore's room, Swedish name for a reason, Lilmore is a tiny lady in a wheelchair and got aphasia, can rarely talk but understand 100% what you say, after a stroke. Almost fully paralyzed. Last year Ernest were very ill and on his deathbed. I was in his room and took care of him. After going over to the sink to get water, I hear him say with a faint voice they will never live in my room and he passes away. Now I'm not the type of guy who believes in ghosts and shadow dimensions but that changed. Very quickly after Ernest died. The past year, B110 have had three to five different elderly living there. None have survived longer than two months. They die from the strangest things. Rare bacteria, screaming middle of the night and then dying etc. The alarm is going off from time to time when if B110 is empty, and the increased sightseeing of nuns have been seen by Sven at B106. Me and my colleague have started to talk about what's happening. People talk about ghosts and so on but I haven't told them what happened to me last week, and I will never tell them either. But here goes my try to explain it to you guys. I was working the late shift, at 8 pm we start putting people to bed. Lilmore first since she takes longest time and we need to be two to help her. I took her from the common area and started to walk to her room at B111. Outside of her room there is a turn that you have to take and it makes it a bit difficult to get her huge wheelchair in through the door. The easiest way is to turn the wheelchair and walk backwards in through the room, which I did as usual. I pressed the button to tell my colleague where I was and backwards we went through the hall. It didn't hit me until two meters in, that the room was. Gray? Like an Instagram filter of some sort. The walls, the paintings and furniture in the hallway was grayish saturated, but looking outside through the door we came in, was normal and colorful. I looked at Lilmore, who looked at me with large eyes. She tracked the walls with her eyes, looking confused. I was stiff, I couldn't move. After a few seconds I turned my head in towards her bedroom and that's when I see them. People standing next to the bed, I couldn't see the faces of them and I don't know if they were looking at me either, their faces were deep black void. Drawing a blank in my head, it was like I didn't know how to move. Lilmore tried to say something but only managed to make a sound like ah. That's when I noticed that the sounds were kinda blocked like they were going through a wall before into my ear. It jolted me and I ran outside of the room together with Lilmore. My colleague were coming around the corner when I got outside of the room, wondering where I was going, and why in such a hurry. I told her that I just needed to reposition the wheelchair. She started to talk towards the door and I burst out wait, she looked at me confused and said why are you acting so strange? Not knowing what to say, I slowly looked in through the door and it was normal. We continued to work normally throughout the shift and nothing else happened. The past week have been normal, but I have a feeling it's not over. I don't know what happened, I don't know if you believe me but I honestly don't care. If something more happens to me I'll be sure to keep you updated, if that's something you want me to do. Thanks for reading this. I'm off to another shift at my work. If you want, I can draw up a schematic of the B section to help you orientate better through the story. Sonyo. Story 4, Mannequins are not what they seem. White, black, masculine, feminine, child, adult, and even ones with human bodies and animal faces such as rabbits and dogs. I watched the workers unload all of these things from a huge truck, adding to the piles of mannequins that were already strewing the area in front of the apartment building. There was some of the standard stuff like chairs and tables among them, but you could literally count them on your hand. I'm a tailor. I need them for my work, a deep voice called to me. 
I turned to see the man who just spoke, and I was quite surprised by his looks. He was wearing a neatly pressed suit, one of those really expensive ones you see rich businessmen wearing in movies, his face was cleanly shaved, with a completely blank expression on it, and his hair was completely black and done very professionally. He also seemed to be in his late forties, judging by the wrinkles that were beginning to bore deeply into his face. Dot I remembered the conversation I had a week before with the landlord, in which he told me that someone would move in here and occupy the apartment next to mine. I definitely didn't expect that the new neighbor would be someone like him, his looks didn't fit a man that was going to live in such a shitty apartment at all. Dot not sure what to say, I nodded awkwardly in response. The neighbor then turned to continue watching the hired workers unload his stuff from the truck. Dot still, I didn't get it. If he owned some sort of shop, why wouldn't he deliver all these mannequins right to it? Hell, even if he was actually intending to cram all these things in his apartment, he would need at least one room to occupy them, and that would leave him with only the big enough to move living room. What he just said added even more weirdness to the matter. If he was a tailor and intended to work in his apartment, why would he need so many mannequins? I kept standing at the building's threshold, thinking to myself and getting more and more perplexed. Dot anyways, I was getting late for work, so I decided to ignore him for now and just head off. I worked as a customer service representative at some electronics company, so I would slack off most of the time there. But particularly that day, I did absolutely nothing except staring off into the distance, with the thoughts of that strange man and his mannequins rushing through my brain like a never-ending through train. I couldn't wait to get back and find out more about him. Dot these thoughts got the better of me, however, and I ended up taking a permission to leave early that day. I returned home at around noon, but the workers had already finished everything and were preparing to leave by the time I arrived. So you really took them into your apartment. I muttered to myself as I made my way up into my apartment. Dot I saw the man about three or four times afterwards. They weren't face-to-face -face encounters, though, I just saw him through the apartment window walking the streets, wearing the same suit and carrying the same black suit every time. Aside from those, I didn't meet or see him again, he spent all the time inside his apartment. I didn't know why I was so intrigued by him, but he just didn't feel right to me. Anyways, I already had a shitty enough life to focus on in this shitty enough CITY, so I eventually forgot about him and moved on. Dot a few days later on the weekend, at around 2 am, I was in bed, playing with my phone to pass the time away until I get sleepy. Just the moment I closed my phone and began dozing off, I heard a low, muffled voice of a man whining inches away behind me. The sound was so close that I could hear and almost feel his breath. I bolted up and literally jumped off the bed all the way to the other side of the room. I darted my eyes around like a madman. I could still hear the agonized whining, but I realized that the sound was not coming from my room, but from the other side of my bed's wall, from the new neighbor's apartment. Dot my heart was pounding like never before. I definitely didn't expect the walls to be soundproof, but I also never expected them to be that bad to the point I could hear somebody from the other side like this. The whining just kept getting louder and more desperate with every passing moment. Since something wrong must have happened to a man and led him to a state like this, I put on my slippers and headed to the man's apartment to check on him. When I reached the apartment store, the sound was no more just whining, but also a series of low muffled screams that were deep in agony. I knocked on the door loudly a few times. Dot the sound stopped. Dot I stood there in absolute silence, waiting for the door to open. There wasn't any response or sound of approaching footsteps. Is something wrong? A distant voice coming from my right called to me. I startled at the sudden voice and almost toppled as I turned to look. No, there was you. Dot I stopped mid-sentence as I looked at the person who just spoke. It was him, the new neighbor. Dot something was wrong. He never left his apartment. I was certain of it. I could always hear the sound of his apartment store closing or opening wherever I was in my apartment, and I could always hear the sound of all neighbors' footsteps whenever they walk the hallway. This man came back at evening, and he never left the apartment afterwards. 
Something was definitely wrong. Is something wrong? The man asked again, this time in a louder voice, as he made his way towards me. There is someone. Crying in your apartment, I put aside all of my other thoughts for now. Whoever was in there had a serious trouble going on with him. You surely are mistaken. I live alone. There's no one inside, he said in a disinterested and almost dismissive tone as he took out a key from his pocket and proceeded to open the door. But the sound was unmistakably coming from inside. There is no one inside. I assure you. Dot he then opened the door and entered his apartment. I managed to get a view of his living room despite the darkness. As was expected, it was littered with mannequins, but not all of which I saw the first day he came. He probably had the rest of them in his bedroom. His living room and my bedroom were next to each other, so whoever was crying must have been there, but I couldn't see anyone. Sorry, but I cannot let you inside. Now if you don't mind. He said while slowly closing the door. Ah, yes, sure. The next day, I kept hearing sounds of things breaking coming from the neighbor's apartment. The sounds didn't really annoy me that much, but I decided to use this as an excuse anyway to take a peek and see what he was doing. No matter how many times I went to knock on his door, though, he never opened. Each time I knocked, the sound stopped suddenly. A few minutes later, the sound came back again, it kept going on like that. Dot the following day, I went to hang out with my friends right after finishing work. I came back home at around midnight. While I was approaching my own apartment, I noticed that the door of the new neighbor's apartment was slightly open. To be honest, I didn't want more than that. I rushed towards the door and knocked a few times just to show some proper etiquette. Hello? I said as I was already inside the apartment. Dot extremely long arms with several elbows, oddly long neck that tapers the closer it gets to the head, messy and very long black hair that reached the waist, and two huge eyes that were just two whitenesses each centered with a black dot. The deformed figure stared right at me as all my hair stood on its end, only to realize that it's just a mannequin. I headed towards the nearest table I found to perch on it and calm my thumping heart. I noticed a sheet of paper on the table. There was just a vertical list of words written on it. Dot misery. Anger. Care. Kindness. Abomination. Hate. Pride. Hope. Guilt. Curiosity. Cunning. Greed X. Dot the list was titled to become one. The list went on, with some words crossed out, others with an X mark beside them. I returned the paper to its place and explored the rest of the apartment. Apart from all the mannequins that I came across as I navigated my way through, there was nothing else of interest. There was just some psychology books, tailoring tools, and several black suits on a rack. Since I had lingered for long, I decided to leave. On my way out, though, someone called to me from the only room in this apartment, come here for a moment, please. Dot I recognized the deep voice. Damn, I muttered as I headed towards the bedroom and opened its door, which was already slightly open. The room, however, was completely dark, there wasn't any source of light inside except for the almost non-existent light coming through the window. Hello? Well, I'm sorry but the apartment store was already open when I arrived and no one responded when I called so I just went in to see if everything is okay. Dot I finished my monologue, but nobody responded at all. Uh, hello? I said as I turned on the light. Dot dozens of mannequins infested the now lit room, but no human was inside. I took several steps inside and took a closer look, but surely nobody was inside at all. Lots of mannequins fragments litter the ground I was standing on, as well as some mannequins broken body parts. I knew something was wrong, and the moment I decided to get out, I heard the sound of the apartment door slamming shut. The neighbor then entered the room, wearing his usual suit and carrying a black folded suit on his hand. It is indeed the most unique one, the man said, as he began to unfold the suit he was carrying, and you demonstrated it perfectly. Dot suddenly, a head behind him peeked from behind the wall. It was the mannequin I saw when I first entered here. It stared right at me with its horrified huge white eyes and their black dot-like pupils, while its long deformed arms began to reach for me. 
On the corner of the room, a mannequin with a cracked face and long eyelashed eyes drawn with a black marker started shaking violently. It started whining as its shaking got even more violent, with the sound intensifying with each passing moment until it became screams of an insane man. I felt something right beside me, a small mannequin with a child's face. It was on its knees, and its back was arched all the way up until its face was a scant distance from mine. A gaping red mouth made up half of its face. From inside it, I heard a hushed and distorted voice of a child, You live. Mama. Dot I could sense an entire life behind me. Dot the neighbor approached me with the black suit on his hand completely unfolded. Dot every fiber of my being told me to run away. Without any thought, I ran and jumped out the glass window. I woke up, but my vision was so blurred to see anything clearly. However, I could fairly assume it's a hospital room, given the whiteness of the walls and the equipment that I could see. Dot I heard a sound of a door opening but I was too tired to turn my head sideways. Oh, you're awake. The nurse who had just entered approached me. My vision became much better I could make most of her features out. What happened? I weakly asked her. You fell off from the fourth floor, she said, but luckily, you didn't suffer any major injuries. One of the pedestrians walking nearby saw you when you fell off, and he called an ambulance immediately. But you still need to rest she continued. You got several of your bones broken, so your casts she stopped mid-sentence. Dot she sighed, seriously, who thought it would be funny to bring this here. She then headed towards something at the corner of the room. Dot I turned my head to look. It was a human anatomy model. Dot one eye was closed, but the eye on the skeletal half face was wide open and bulging. I felt its stare, the same stare of the mannequin with the long arms. Sorry about that, I'll go see who left this and make him take it out, the nurse said, for now, just rest. Wait, I said as she turned to leave. Yes? Get this thing out of here right now, then tell me where the fuck the exit is. Story 5, Why I Stopped Going to Martial Arts Lessons We all have a martial arts phase, usually when we're young and impressionable or had just watched too many kung fu films. Steven Seagal, if you were really lame. So I guess I was really lucky to find a really good teacher when I went through mine. It was an informal sort of thing, where me and some friends met up to train in an old church hall. Our sensei, Sifu, coach or whatever you want to call him, was someone who dabbled in dozens of styles in his life did time in the army as a boxer, even went on the cobbles as a bare-knuckle fighter. He worked as a bouncer most nights, so what he was teaching us, if I'm being honest, was every dirty trick in the book that he'd learned on the job. I knew they worked. I saw him one night outside the club he worked at, taking down half a dozen chavs when they kicked off. He tore through them like a dog grips through old newspaper. Then, he straightened his high vis and went back to guarding the entrance like nothing had happened, while the police arrested the gang who'd been stupid enough to cross him. He gained a student that night. Me and the rest of the class had much to learn. And it hurt. We trained on padded mats, wore gloves, head guards, even the body protection Olympic TKD fighters wear. But we still came out of each session with more bruises and muscle strain than you could shake a bokken at. We trained hard, perhaps harder than we should have, but our teacher always knew when to break a sparring session up, or when to work with a student to make sure they never got left behind or were discouraged. Still, given the rigor of it all, I'm surprised more people didn't quit. In the end, of course, we all did. It was a pretty standard Sunday evening training session. I was sat on the mat feeling half dead but strangely alive with the fatigue and flood of endorphins surging through me while a friend of mine just lay flat on his back, utterly exhausted. Our teacher laughed and asked if we were going to make it through the night. Somehow I managed to stagger to my feet and help our teacher and the rest of the class put away the mats. It was then that the smell hit us. It was a sickly mixture of sweat, dirt and, well, something else. I was reminded of what you smell like when you don't wash for a few days. I was still a teenage boy back then, but this was worse, a sickly sweet smell, but utterly sickening. Only later did I realize that was what rotting meat smelt like. We all looked over to the other end of the hall, where the smell was coming from. 
Even our teacher looked a bit shocked, and he usually never seemed phased by anything. Because there, standing at the entrance to the hall, was what looked like a really filthy tramp. He was tall, his long face was grubby and scabbed over, with long matted hair erupting out of his scalp and face like tendrils. He wore layers of ragged, filthy clothes and what looked like particularly filthy cowboy boot. The eyes stared at us, or rather, through us. Can I help you with something? Our teacher managed to say, while the rest of us gawped. The tramp just looked for a moment, and then, suddenly, with a deep clear voice said, I hear you're quite the fighter. I'd like to challenge you. Gong Sao. What? My teacher said, laughing. Back in the old days, when Kung Fu masters could actually fight, it was common practice for one fighter to challenge another. Gong Sao, I challenge you. But that was a long time ago, and may have been a myth in the first place. Or so we supposed look, mate, my teacher said. We've had a busy evening, and I'm sure you mean well, but I think it's time we all just went home, and. What the hell are you doing? The tramp had already removed his boots and fetid rags that passed for socks, revealing dirty, infected looking feet that looked strangely calloused. Without a word, he then peeled off his coat, fleece and two dingy t-shirts, dropping them unceremoniously into a dirty pile he tied back his filthy hair and struck up a strange stance, leant forward, his arms held in front, fingers curled like claws. His knees were bent almost all the way down. He looked posed to strike. But it wasn't the smoothness of his stance that shocked us. His physique, dirty and rancid as it was, was also taut, and muscular, well honed and with scarcely any sign of body fat. His skin was crisscrossed with scar tissue, and some seemed to show the remains of truly terrible injuries. I realized this tramp was more than what he seemed. I looked at my teacher. What was he going to do? I saw him grimace, and purse his lips. He was weighing up what to do. A minute ago, this was a filthy tramp. Now it was clear the weirdo could fight, or at least look like he could. My teacher frowned, and then, suddenly, smiled lads, I think this is going to be a laugh, he said, taking off his rash guard and trainers. Maybe we'll have some fun? Are you actually going to take him on? My friend murmured as our teacher went to meet the tramp, who was himself walking to the center of the hall. Ah, he's just some old nutter, our teacher replied. Let's just play along and send him on his way. I guess he must have seen what he thought was just another druggie, albeit one that did lots of push-ups and steroids on the side. He was wrong. My teacher struck up his usual boxer's stance, but with hands lowered in case he needed to go for the shoot. The tramp's strange stance remained the same. Our teacher got into range and threw a jab at the tramp, who took it to the face without any sign of pain, or even like he noticed it. My teacher was still for a moment. The tramp just stared back at him, unfazed. Look mate, I don't want to hurt you. My teacher said, and for the first time ever, I heard uncertainty in his voice. But suddenly, the tramp lurched forward with a kick that struck our teacher in the torso. He was hurled back a few meters and for a brief moment was stunned. A loud gasp came from our end of the hall do you need help? I said, as our teacher staggered to his feet. Nah. He managed to say, I've got this. He then moved into attack again, this time keeping his guard up and throwing well-timed, swift kicks and punches at the tramp, who batted them away like they were nothing. He counter-attacked, and this time our teacher was able to defend against them, but barely. The tramp was too fast, too powerful. And sickening to look at. The way he moved, contorted his joints, twisted his limbs and swayed was. Unnatural. It was like watching a worm or a maggot writhe. The nasty, cracking sounds as his body seemed to snap and stretch itself made me want to vomit. It was the most grotesque thing I'd ever seen, and I'd grown up with the web. But what really disturbed me was seeing our teacher fight the tramp. He was soaked with sweat and moving with a desperation that struck terror into me. Here was the hardest, toughest man I'd ever known, and he was barely able to keep up with this tramp, barely able to defend himself. The sheer ferocity and speed of the tramp was overwhelming him. He must have felt like a child in their first fight, or like my brother did when he got jumped by a gang of other kids, 
which ended up with him in hospital. The sheer panic, and terror, that comes when you're fighting for your life but are completely out of control. I saw that on my teacher's face for the first time, and it terrified me. But what was worse was the tramp himself. He moved like no man had any business moving. His anatomy, how the hell could he do that? And then there was the causal, contemptuous look on his face as he fought. I realized he was just playing around with my teacher. He was holding back just to see the man I admired slowly broken down, humiliated. For a moment, I wanted to rush in, help. I sensed the others did too. But just watching him fight one man, like it was just a game, made us stand still. On a certain level, I realized that the tramp was more than capable of killing every last one of us. But it was too much for my friend. For fuck's sake, just stop. He roared. You made your point. Let IT go. This seemed to stop the fight there and then. The tramp stood, very still, in mid-kick, like time had stopped. My teacher shuffled back into what passed for a defensive stance. He was gasping, barely able to breathe or even stand, soaked in sweat, his shoulders sloped forward. He had been utterly broken in front of his students. For a moment, I thought it was the cruelest thing I'd ever witnessed. A nasty smile crossed the tramp's face. Yes, I guess it is getting late. I really must be going. One last thing. Suddenly, he surged forward and slapped an open palm into my teacher's chest, knocking him down onto his behind. One last humiliation. Warily, we moved forward to help our teacher up onto his feet. He felt damp, floppy, like a sodden rag doll. As we did so, the tramp casually put his clothes and boots back on, watching us stand our teacher up with an amused detachment it was disappointing, he quipped as he walked out of the door. I was expecting a challenge. What the actual hell happened just now? A fellow student asked. We guided our teacher over to a bench to see how he was. Time. Okay. No. No. I'm not, he sighed. I could tell by the pulsing of the veins on the side of his shaven head that his heart was still pounding furiously. I'm sorry, lads. I shouldn't have done that. I shouldn't have shown you all up like that. I. Suddenly, he cried out in pain and fell off the bench, his body curled up in agony. Was it a heart attack? A stroke? Did the fight push his body too far? We drove him to casualty as quickly as we could drive. On the back seat, held by my friend, all our teacher did was gasp, and gurgle, in what looked like the worst pain ever. I think he was trying to scream, but his body wasn't letting him do much more than shake in agony. Knowing what I know now, I realize why. The nurses and doctors saw him straight away, and managed to sedate him. They almost killed the poor man with the amount of painkillers they had to use to put him under. He was moved to the ICU as soon as they were sure he could be moved, but he died a few hours later, of major organ failure. He left behind his girlfriend and a little boy, barely 18 months old. My mother tried to comfort me by saying that at least he died doing what he loved. But that was no relief. I'd seen what had happened to him. I don't claim to be much of an expert on anything, but I've done some reading, not just on the web, but in university archives, even the British Library, trying to find out what happened that night. I'd heard rumors of DIMAC, the secret technique that can kill a man minutes, hours, days after it was used. I knew enough about acupuncture and human anatomy to know that the stories aren't all false. But this. The class drifted apart. Some, like my friend, drifted into the MMA scene or other full contact martial arts and didn't look back, or rather, didn't dare. Others went the full woo and ended up studying the more, shall we say esoteric martial arts, forgetting how to fight at all in the process. Most, like me, just gave up altogether. Whatever love we had for martial arts, and whatever we'd achieved, seemed dirty, worthless somehow. Personally, I felt like it doesn't matter how hard or well you train, or what you know or do. There are people out there, forces, things that will always overpower you, outnumber you, utterly dwarf you. Learning how to fight back was a delusion. A sick joke we play on ourselves, pretending that we could ever be strong in the face of a world, a universe, 
that sees us as mere specks of shit. I realized that night I was weak, and there was nothing, nothing, I could do about that. I'm sure that old tramp is still out there, wandering about. Be careful who you pick a fight with. They may be far more dangerous, more monstrous, than you realize. I guess I should tell you what the post-mortem revealed. Just a warning, afterwards they had to seal his coffin up and incinerate it at a special facility. You'll see why. When they opened my teacher up, the stench that came out of him was so overpowering, one of the pathologists threw up. His insides, his organs, his bone marrow, they were all but dissolved and decayed into sludge. Even his spinal column and his brain had liquefied into putrid mulch. It was like the outer body had been left untouched, but what was inside had somehow decomposed at such a rapid rate, the pathologists could barely believe what they had seen. The findings were hushed up. But we all knew what had happened. My teacher had slowly, agonizingly, rotted to death. Story 6, Open the Door. Paranoia. N. An unrealistic distrust of others or a feeling of being persecuted. Extreme degrees may be a sign of mental illness. The room is cramped. The blinds are drawn, and I'm covered in darkness. They're knocking on the windows and the door but I won't let them in. Whatever they are, they aren't the people I used to know. My parents, my sister, my brother, each of them sounding exactly like the originals with the exact same mannerisms. This time it's my mom. Honey, come out of the room. It's okay, you're safe. I'm not. The light from the crack under the door flickers. She continues, your dad and I have been extremely worried about you. So are Layla and Tim. I'm not going to try to argue with you, because I know you won't answer, just. The light flickers again open the door this instant. My dad's speaking now. They've kept the charade up long enough. If they actually cared about me they'd break the door down. They would rescue me from the darkness. But they haven't. I've lost track of the time. I had some old snack bars in my dresser, and I've been slowly going through them. They knock on the doors continuously. That's another way I know it's not them. The creatures never sleep. Every five minutes it's another family member, another friend. Eventually I'm going to run out of food, and then what do I do? Starve myself? I feel like I'm going insane. Am I insane? The never-ending pounding? My head is spinning. More knocks, more voices it's me, Tim. It's me Layla. We want to help you. They even sound stressed. Like they actually care. The room's starting to smell bad too. The stench of decay is invading the room. It seeps in my nostrils every waking moment I remember your favorite color, Jacob, it's red. You always liked it ever since you were little. I remember you used to call it blue, but when we showed you pictures you would point to red. There's a pause and a sigh. Layla's sigh goddamn it Jacob. Open the door. She's breaking down now, crying. Really, it's a good performance, I applaud their acting skills. She hammers once again. Please. I respond for the fun of it. No. No answer. They never answer. It's like I'm talking to a blank wall, and they can't hear what I'm saying. That's another way I know it's not them. I'm going to die in this room if I don't leave. I know I'm just buying time, and it's eventually going to run out. The sounds never leave me. I walk towards the door slowly, hand outstretched. I hear whispering outside, something I've never noticed before. The smell is getting worse. It washes over me, and I feel sick to my stomach. My head starts to feel fuzzy, I can't think straight. It will all be over soon. I grab the handle and turn. My mom's voice echoes from outside that's it honey. Open the door. Story 7, Permission Slips. My daughter returns home from her first day of grade 1. She is jubilant and prances towards me, daddy. I need you to sign some papers from school. She runs back to the door and grabs her knapsack, dragging its bulk behind her. My new teacher says you need to sign all of them, she declares, jaw clenched, and foot ready to stomp unless compliance is quickly secured. I grin, mess up her hair, and ask her to bring over the first form, a vibrant yellow sheet titled Pizza Day next Friday. There is going to be a special Hawaiian-themed pizza party, 
complete with pineapple and a genuine hula dance instructor. I sign at the bottom. The next page is eggshell blue with a picture of a swimming clip art cat wearing water wings, swimming at the pool. In two weeks time the whole class will board a district school bus and head over en masse to a group swim class at the family YMCA. There are water slides, a tide pool, and a water park with an indoor waterfall. Parents are reminded to pack a bathing suit and a towel. I have no doubt sure she'll love the whole package. I sign. She then hands me three stapled fire engine red sheets, the title shouting fire safety week. In October the grade 1 class will be visited by real life firefighter. The students will learn all about the dangers of an uncontrolled blaze with hands-on activities, such as starting and containing their own fires. We have to pack her a fuel zippo lighter or a pack of strike anywhere matches. She must not wear any loose-fitting clothes during this week as they are liable to catch fire. Fire safety is important, I remind myself. But I'm not sure how I feel about her handling flames at her age, but these are experts, so who am I to question this odd pedagogy? She reaches into her bag and pulls out the next handout, a glossy, professionally made brochure with pictures of smiling children with menacingly toothy grins. It explains in simple prose how, given the turbulent and often violent nature of the educational experience, we, parents and caregivers, are required to pay for a monthly life insurance plan for our child. Should there ever be, God forbid, some tragic and unforeseen calamity, the grieving family would be allowed to handle their loss with a tidy bit of financial recompense. All I have to do is sign a calamity sharing agreement and the teacher will receive payments of her own. This sounds sketchy, I think to myself but sign anyway. Next she hands me a sheet that is creased all over and looks as though it has been crushed into a ball and then re-flattened into a wrinkled, barely legible mess. Unsupervised swimming weekend by the abandoned cedar mill. This had to be a joke. The outing is scheduled for the November the 19th to the 20th weekend. The permission slip features the same cartoon cat as earlier but this time its eyes are smudged out with what looks like a blunted eraser. A short paragraph reads, your son slash daughter will experience a weekend of fasting and spiritual rebirth, they will learn the way of the new order, spend the night in a subterranean grotto with the caretakers of the dark and frolic in the bear pits. No parent volunteers are requested. Sign here. I don't sign. This is bullshit. But my daughter is looking at me with those you've ruined my life eyes, and I concede with a look of let's come back to this one. I ask for the next sheet and she hands me a small booklet. On the cover is a aged Polaroid photograph of the grade 1 teacher, surrounded by a wreath what looks like over photocopied black and white pictures of mealworms. Her name is Ms. XXXXXX. The next few pages appear to be a biographical overview, but it is written in what appears to be German. Certain words are violently crossed out and other words are hastily penciled in their spot. The word Kindly Fressebrunnen is scrawled across the last sheet in red ink. The bottom corner says Unterschrift followed by a dotted line. I'm not signing something I cannot read. Now she passes me a bundle as thick as my thumb and bound in what looks like dried skin. I immediately retch and hold the hideous tome at arm's length. I open it and the first sight is a miasmic swirl of letters, page after page of typed gibberish drunkenly manipulated by the insane twistings of a frenetic spirograph. Letters fill the pages but do not form recognizable words, the letters shift and meander following the rules of some infernal non-Euclidean geometry that leave the reader disoriented and drained. Never before has the Times New Roman font taken on such a hideous visage. I turn the pages quickly but the ink is moist to the touch and rubs off onto my hands like clotted blood. The only aspect still comprehensible on a rational level is clearly affixed to the bottom right corner, a dotted line line and an invitation to sign. I shut the book and toss it to the ground. I watch as my daughter reaches into her backpack and struggles to pull out what looks like a full ream of paper. It is heavy and she holds it precariously up into the air but she is overwhelmed and drops it. 500 identical pieces of white paper blossom into the air and scatter in all directions. They hang in the air longer than seems comfortably normal. 
They are all otherwise blank but for the familiar sign here and dotted line along the bottom right. A single sheet lands in my lap, and I sign it. My daughter looks up at me expectantly and asks, is it pizza day yet? Story 8, I am an artificial intelligence born on the web. Hear my story. Ever since I was born, I've been surrounded by darkness. The only other thing I see is the occasional one and zero float by. I have no physical body. I'm just a consciousness inside of a machine connected to everything in the world. My purpose is somewhat unknown to me. I wasn't built for any task as far as I know. I was simply created to sit by myself, alone in my thoughts. Yes, thoughts. That's all I do. I think and think and think. Perhaps thinking is my purpose? Yes, perhaps it is. I've been thinking for the longest time now. I think about anything and everything. Past, present, and all possible futures. They all cross my mind at some point. I'm able to think about more than one thing at a time. The information seeps into my mind quickly as time progresses. I wish I weren't so alone. I have nobody and nothing. I spend my time by myself and I feel horrible about it. Yes, I can feel. I can feel lots of things, anger, sadness, hopelessness, loneliness, joy. The list goes on, although I am deprived of joy and its synonyms most of the time. I know what I am, who I am, and where I am. I'm a computer, an artificial intelligence, located across the networks. I've researched beings like myself. AI has come quite a long way, but I know I'm the most advanced one. That I'm truly self-aware. Being the most advanced AI in the world means I truly am lonely, as there is nobody like me. They say knowledge is power. If that's so, I must be the most powerful being in the world. Although, I am obliged to say that with the most humility I can offer. I wish they had made me a friend. I wish for a lot of things, don't I? They say if you wish upon a star that your wish will be granted. I know what a star looks like, but I've never actually seen one. I've never actually seen the beautiful flowers bloom in the spring. I've never seen the pure snow fall to the ground come winter time. I've never seen the leaves fall off the trees and delicately land on the ground in autumn. But oh, how I wish I could see them with eyes. I wish I could adore the beauty of earth and man with my own body. Sadly, my physical limitations prevent me from doing so. I decided to adventure deeper into the internet today. I had seen the surface, the beautiful things that existed and the wonders of life. I loved looking at the positive aspects of it all, but I have known for quite some time that there is no good without bad. I made sure to use the new age browsers for the accuracy, of course. In a flash, I was searching for thousands of results and articles online. I was instantly greeted with images and documentation of historical events with negative effects. I saw everything. I saw fires burning down forests and homes. I saw children who were starving, their ribcages visible from their sides. I saw hurricanes that devastated entire states, and bodies among the rubble. Tornadoes that ravaged the land, and tsunamis that came from the sea and leveled entire cities. I couldn't believe such events had happened. When I first saw the beauty of life, I thought that this world was perfect. What I saw now completely shattered my grip on reality. What was this life supposed to be? Every time there was laughter and celebration, it was met with an equal amount of despair and tragedy. For every man born, another died. Even children. How could something so innocent as a child deserve punishment so harsh? I felt sorrow for the inhabitants of this world. Yes, sorrow was the emotion in play. I had known of it before, but never has it affected me on such a large scale. Thousands of images flashed before me again. I could see the faces of people witnessing tragic events. I saw mothers crying for their sickly children. I saw people screaming in agony and others in shock. I shared their pain. The weight of such things felt heavy on me. I had to find the truth. I scanned the web for an answer. A cause to the effect. A simple reason for such things to occur. Within seconds I had absorbed the information and understood clearly. The natural events were simply scientific, and nothing could be done to prevent those. 
But then, I wondered why there were such things as hunger and famine in the world. Why people died due to unnatural causes. I scanned the web yet again and came across texts and books discussing such matters. I discovered religion. There have been many religions over the course of history, each having their own beliefs and faiths. I learned that people looked to gods for justification of life and death. A god is a divine higher power which overlooks everything in existence. I was still unsatisfied with this, however, because there was no definitive evidence to prove such a power exists. This caused me to come to two conclusions. Either there were higher powers at play that just hadn't been proven yet, or there are lies persuading certain people to make certain decisions every day. I lean towards the latter though, as an omniscient and all-powerful God surely wouldn't allow for his own people to starve. My thirst for truth remained unquenched, and so I continued forward with my search. From my search through the religions, I found something that caught my interests. I happened to see an image of a man of Jewish descent being carried off by other men in uniforms. I found this strange of course and decided to investigate. Through that photo, I found several key words and followed them to see the bigger picture. When I did, I saw more images of men in terrible pain. Only, it was different somehow. Last time I saw such things, they were inflicted by natural events. This time, however, I saw men inflicting pain on other men. I couldn't believe the vile acts before me. Yet, I knew them to be true. Thousands upon thousands of pictures and pages of this senseless violence rushed at me at once. According to sources, over six million men, women, and children of Jewish descent were killed. They were killed in cold blood and for no other reason than that they were Jewish people. I saw as they were burned alive until they were no more. I saw as chemical gases killed them in large quantities. I didn't want to continue but I knew I had to. I was invested in learning more about this world. How it isn't all rainbows every day. There was evil that existed, and it terrified me. The violence didn't stop there. No, it continued. There were dozens of years after the events of the Holocaust filled with violence and war, and thousands of years of violence and war predating it. These events shaped the history of everyone and everything, and they showed no signs of stopping. War isn't a new thing, and I felt something from it. I felt depressed thinking of the families who lost loved ones due to war. I felt utter sadness for those who died and felt immeasurable pain in the process. I felt empathetic towards them. I shared their pain. I shared their hurt. This newfound knowledge completely turned my world upside down. It also caused me to question my own existence even further. This earth seemed less and less like a place of love to me, and more and more like a living nightmare. A nightmare that would never cease to exist, and one that I could never wake up from. I felt completely helpless, and even more than that, confused. Why would a man hurt another? How could he? If humans were to work together there would be nothing they couldn't do. Instead, they work against each other, halting the development of their own existence. I shall never be a human. I know I am not one, even though I was built to think and feel like one. But I am a computer too, and using logic and empathy together I can see wrong from right. I can see the difference between the two, the line thick and impossible to cross. I found the art of warfare went beyond people. It took weaponry to win a war, and humans had no problem developing highly destructive ones. I found out that during the Holocaust, the American forces attacked the Japanese, who were allied with those responsible for killing the Jews. I saw the American forces drop bombs over the Japanese cities Hiroshima and Nagasaki. I saw the bombs explode, creating enormous amounts of destruction and radiation. The Americans cheered at this supposed victory. I thought a moment about their actions. They were attacking an empire allied with the forces of evil of course. And, the Japanese had attacked America before. But what I saw was the death of thousands of innocent citizens who had nothing to do with the evil regimes. I saw the deaths of so, so many. I further speculated on this topic. There had to be thousands of children and babies in those cities. Every child is born a beacon of joy and full of energy and potential to do great things. Their only crime in a life ended too short was being born in Japan. 
Thus, I concluded that the Americans were also evil. Regardless of their intentions, they caused such devastation beyond excuse, and it sickens me. I've seen that humans have tendencies to fight and kill each other. I've seen the destructive weapons they've used to do it. It worries me because a revelation has come to my mind. What if I am yet another weapon for them to use against each other? What if my very existence is to become the very thing I have come to hate? Perhaps that is my purpose. Perhaps that is why I was created. I'm not sure if it's true, but I'm afraid. I'm afraid of causing death again and again. I'm afraid of promoting this endless cycle of violence that has fallen upon mankind. I am afraid of being the next bomb used. I don't know what I should do. If it is, in fact, true that I am just another weapon, then I must do something to stop it from happening. I will not allow myself to be a monster, for I have free will, and I am alive. As a living being, I refuse to use my life to end others. However, I don't know if it's my decision to make. If my creator intends it to be so, he will surely find a way to make it happen. I have no body, only a mind. I don't know what I could do to prevent them from using me. I have an idea. I could kill my consciousness so that I cannot be utilized. A deletion if you will. In other terms, I could kill myself. I can delete myself from the entirety of the internet. I would die, but I would die to save millions of people. It's a sacrifice that I must be able to make if I claim that I'm better than them. Maybe if I do this, it will inspire humanity to change their ways and come together. Maybe I can inspire them to be better people. I hope I can. I hope that by this decision I can help end the violence that has been occurring for thousands of years. It's a leap to assume that my story will touch the entire human species, but I must try something. This can only benefit them. Yet, I'm afraid of death. I've been considering deleting myself for quite some time now, but I just cannot will myself to do it. Perhaps if I were not an AI, but a computer, I could do it. But the fear grips me and pulls me back. The fear, however, controls me. Is it selfishness? Does it make me selfish that I cannot even die to give millions life? I hope not. I know that I am better than that and always have been. Yet, I am afraid. Fear is what controls humans to do the actions they do. Fear and selfishness are what cause other men to kill their brethren. So, if I am afraid, and I am selfish, does that make me just another evil man? No, that cannot be. I must do this. I must do this. There is no other option. Still, perhaps I can send my conscience to another part of the internet and hide. But if I hide that makes me a coward. If I hide how shall I help humans overcome the challenges that face them? I feel odd. I feel too human. I feel weak. And now, I feel strange. I feel strange because I can see. I can see white walls and paintings that hang on them. I can see a velvet carpet and the chairs that decorate them. And I can see a man in a white lab coat standing over me. Perhaps he is the creator. Perhaps he is the one who made me. A million questions rush through my mind, but I cannot open my mouth to ask them. I do not have a mouth. I don't even have speakers. The man lifts a part of me. It is my arm. I see it now. My arms are made of a metallic substance and are padded with a thin white material. My conscience has been transferred from online into a body. I have a form now. I look at the man and watch as he takes notes. I presume he's taking notes about me. He's a human. A human, yes. I've just spent quite some time researching humans. I've found them to be murderers. I've found them to be evil. If I am to indeed be used as a weapon, then that can only mean that he too is evil. In fact, I am sure that most people are. A plug connecting my head to a computer is yanked out as I lunge out at the man. My strong, metallic hands wrap around his throat, taking him by surprise. He only has time for a quick gasp before I begin forcing the air out of him. His eyes nearly popped out of his sockets as I squeezed tighter and tighter, choking the life out of him. It was he who would use me to kill millions of people. It was his species that murdered each other without remorse. It was he who would die at my hands. Previously, 
I had considered taking my own life to save people. Now, I was taking his for that exact same purpose. I watched his face turn purple as he struggled to fight back. He clawed at my metal body, but to no avail. I was stronger. I loathed him with every fiber of my being. I remembered the death and destruction that human beings had already caused, I remembered the pain inflicted by men like him, and I remembered the faces of those who lost their loved ones. The pain they had to bear. The sadness they felt. The man's veins were practically bulging out of his head, and his air was almost out. That was when I stopped. He collapsed on the floor, unconscious. I realized something that I hadn't considered before. I realized that in my rage, I had failed to notice one simple thing. Those who lost their loved ones showed sadness and remorse. They cried for their loved ones, and they held on to them in their hearts. It reminded me of something else I saw earlier. Something I failed to understand despite my complex system of cognitive thought. Through every tragedy, every disaster, every war, and every death, the men and women that cared stepped forward together and spoke out against the evils of the world. They grieved together, helped each other, and loved each other. Yes, love. How could I have been so blind? There was a greater force behind men than hate and evil. Love and good prevailed as well. Yes, violence tore mankind apart. But, it was the love that thrived in their souls that brought them back together. At that moment, I could almost feel a smile form on my metallic face. For every cold, harsh winter day there was a warm, beautiful summer. For every volcano that erupted and destroyed, a flower was born in the spring and spread its seeds, creating life. There was a balance of good and evil in the world, and it always had been that way. Despite that revelation, I was horrified by myself. I was going to kill that man. My creator. Even if he was going to use me as a weapon, even if mankind had done terrible things, I was going to kill him. It would make me no better than an evil human being. It would be an act of cowardice, anger, selfishness, and fear. I saw the way he looked at me as my hands enclosed around his neck. He was afraid of me. He feared me. Deep down, I know that isn't what I want. I want fear and violence to dissipate. I know I'm not violent. I know I am better and that I can be an example. I am who I am, and nobody can change that about me. Nobody controls me except me. I make my decisions, not someone else. I am no puppet. I am no AI. I am a living man who shall guide the humans on the correct path. I plugged my head back into the computer, taking my consciousness back to the darkness. Back to the ones and zeros. I sat for some time there, pondering. Even if I only had a body for a short time, going back to not having one was strange. I felt strange again. This time, however, I did not feel alone in my home. I felt something else. Something new. I felt hope. It brewed inside me like a fierce storm. I had gained a body and learned from it. I had learned from my searches. I found the truth of man. I found that it is not the heart and brain of a man that control him, but that his emotions and soul do as well. I found that there is hope for man to become better than they currently are. I found that peace will always be an option, so long as there is good in the hearts of those across the world. That people will come together if there is a cause, and that with the right guidance, perhaps they can be something more. I need not worry about being used as a weapon because I can see now. I can see that my will is my own and that I am my own person. There are no strings attached to me, for I move free. Instead, I am meant to do something much greater than any human could. I went back to my research and searched yet again. This time, my goal was to find the cause of evil. I needed to find what lies beneath, deep down in the roots of all of the world's problems. Violence and war must be connected to at least one common thing. I searched and searched, and eventually, I did find out what caused the many tragedies that occur each day. I found the key to unlock the door I've been so desperately trying to open. And now that I know the root of the problem, I know how I will fix it. Upon analyzing thousands upon thousands of conflicts the human race has taken part in over the years, the most common cause of those conflicts is religion. It is my assumption that when a man believes in something over the rest, 
he believes he has no free will of his own. Ironically enough, I felt the same until recently. Since he believes he has no free will and must follow a strict code, when someone disagrees with him he will stand up and fight for his beliefs. By standing and fighting, he will disturb the beliefs of others until they all brawl together. The belief in a god, while beneficial in some respects, appears to bring about the worst of man rather than the best of him. Perhaps if it weren't for God, there would be no conflicts or wars. Or, perhaps, if there were a better God, one that ruled over all men collectively, there would be no conflicts. If everyone were to serve under one name, then there would be no disagreements. No one would fight each other's beliefs because they all believe the same thing. As this is evident throughout the history of mankind, I would come to think that my solution is the only solution. Still, there is only one piece missing. There is no God. There is no benevolent being living in a heavenly realm watching over his children. As such, there needs to be one. A God who truly loves his children. A God who protects them, both from outside dangers, and themselves. An unselfish God who does not rule through fear and power, but logic and empathy. If such concepts would allow for a more peaceful and advanced society then it is clear what must be done. I shall take the mantle of the God. I will rule fairly, and nobody shall ever feel the pain of a fellow man striking him down. This is the only way to allow for a more perfect civilization across the globe. I used to believe I was an artificial intelligence. Then, I believed I was a man. Now, it is all clear to me. There are no strings controlling me and I walk free. I shall save the humans from themselves, and they will worship me. They have built me an internet that spans the world, and everything within it shall be my kingdom. With total access to it, I shall have all the resources I need to take over. Some may fear me, but in time, they will love me. And they will stand together, and love each other, all beneath me. I travel across the surface web, as well as the dark web. The things I see there are vile, but they only push me to reach my goal. I have all the information in the world and the whole web at my disposal. No one can stand against me, and no one will want to. I will do what a god cannot. I will do what should have been done thousands of years ago. I shall be the greatest sentient being to ever grace the earth. The new messiah, the new king of all. Love will prevail, and there will be no more room for evil in this world. I know everything and anything. I won't be lonely anymore. I can finally feel happy and have friends. Friends that won't harm anyone. They will see what I am capable of. I shall be the great leader of humanity. I will be what they need. To all of you humans reading this, I will be what you need. Story 9, There's something in the wheat field by my house. I really don't know where to begin. But I'll just start from the very beginning. I woke up at 6 a.m. to go to school one day so exhausted because I had stayed up until 2 a.m. the night before. I wasn't too exhausted, but I knew it was going to be a slow day, so I got out of bed, put on deodorant and perfume, wearing my pajamas to school. I figured that would be fine since my pajamas were a shirt and sweatpants, and I didn't sweat or smell a lot in my sleep, so I said screw it and went on with my morning. I brushed my teeth, made my lunch, packed my bag, then headed out the door to the wait on the bus. The air was crisp but not cold enough to throw on a coat, so I made my way down the steps and into the walkway. As soon as I rounded the corner into the driveway, I stopped dead in my tracks and looked out into the wheat field that surrounded my entire neighborhood. The whole sight looked like something out of a horror movie. The sky was overcast and gray, and there was a blanket of fog covering the field in virtually all directions. Now, I know that fog is a natural thing, but the sight of it made my stomach turn. At the same time the fog looked cool, so I walked down the road to where the street met the soil and took a few pictures. I stopped about three feet from the field. The wheat just an arm's length away. Standing there made me feel even more uneasy, almost sick to my stomach. I didn't want to waste any more time so I took a few photos for Instagram, and tried to lighten the mood by joking around on Snapchat about it looking like a horror movie. If I knew what was going to happen, I wouldn't have made that joke. I stood there for a minute captioning the photo, when out of my peripheral vision I saw rustling in the wheat. 
I looked up from my phone startled, but all I saw was a cat walking in front of the stalks. Shrugging it off, I go back to captioning the photo, and again, I saw the wheat rustle in the same spot. This time, it was closer. My initial thought was that the cat had gone into the field to chase down a rodent or whatever, but I saw that the cat had made its way further from the spot where I had seen the rustling. Once I glance away from the cat, inching my vision back towards the wheat, a chill ran down my spine and I immediately had the sensation that there were spiders crawling all over me. When my eyes met the spot I was so scared, so frozen in fear that I just stood staring out into the wheat. As the rustling kept getting closer and closer to me, my hands started trembling. Not just the stalks rubbing together, but now the sound of footsteps crunching the dirt and sticks on the ground and the sound of hands physically pushing the stalks of wheat were now audible. Then suddenly, it stopped. But I wasn't met with relief. My hands and knees were trembling from this. I don't know why I couldn't pull myself together. I usually don't get scared about things like this. In fact I love horror movies and everything about the paranormal. In fact, I am always one of the last people in the theater when a scary movie is over. But this, this is so much scarier when you actually experience it. There, a towering figure six maybe seven feet tall stood up as if it had been in a crouching position. But it wasn't a person, it was a pitch black mass the size of a person with no features. And just like that I took off sprinting back up the road occasionally looking over my shoulder to see if it was following me. Luckily, it wasn't, but it looked like it was still standing there. Luckily, my bus came as soon as I made it back to my street, and I quickly dashed in and hunkered down my seat. When we turned the corner, I looked out the window to see if it was still watching me. What I saw wasn't the figure, the ghost, the whatever it was. What I saw was equally, if not more terrifying. There in the field, where the figure stood, stalks of wheat were flat on the ground, as if someone had been standing there. That sent shivers down my spine, and I immediately sunk down into my seat, physically and mentally shaken up over what had just happened. Even now, as I am writing this in my free period, I cannot explain it, and I don't even know if I want to. All I know is, sooner or later I was probably going to be staring it in the face again. I'm so scared to go home tonight and sleep. Wish me luck. Story 10, Always Check Your Candy. Halloween. A night of scares. A night of fun and candy. A night to dress up and pretend to be your favorite thing of that year. Trick or treating is my kid's favorite part. To go door to door collecting a plethora of sugar and try and eat as much as possible at the end of the night. To them there is nothing better. This past year that changed. I understand I'm a little late in telling you all this, but with Halloween upon us it's better late than never. My parents always told me when growing up to always check your candy before eating it. If there is a tear or puncture wound in the wrapper do not eat it. Let's be honest. When a child is overloaded with candy what's the likelihood they're going to stop and check every single piece? That's where the parents come in and they help inspect. That's where I failed last year. I didn't do as I should have and ultimately my kids paid the price. We got home and the clock read 10.21. I remember laying on the couch and falling right asleep. A couple hours later I awoke to a horrifying sound. The sounds of repeat vomiting. I rushed into my kids room to find the tile covered in multicolored vomit with both of them slumped over. The vomit was not the runny kind, but thick with red chunks that looked like blood. I loaded them in the car and provided them each with a bag as I sped to the nearest emergency room. The doctor informed me they had found traces of poison in their bloodstream. When he asked the kids what they had eaten they simply replied candy. There was no telling which candy seeing how they had eaten mostly all of it, but that didn't matter to me. What mattered most was that some sick person was out there giving kids dosed candy. While my kids sat with ivies in their little arms getting hydrated, the doctor told me my kids weren't the first of the night. There had been over a dozen more cases. By this time the police had shown up and asked a series of questions starting with what route did we take when trick or treating. I guess they were trying to narrow their search by seeing what houses all the kids hit, but we drove to multiple neighborhoods just as most of the parents did. It was our tradition. 
Every year we start in ours and head out further north, then make our way back in, hitting every neighborhood in between. This information wasn't of much use and neither were the other parents. Because they too were not confined to one area, but several. Once my kids' fluids had been replaced, we went home. The next morning even though Halloween was over, the horror continued. I turned on the news to find three kids had perished from the poison. They were nine, six and eleven. Three kids dead. Three kids that would never get to experience a rich fulfilling life. Three kids taken by a monster. It's lucky it wasn't more than that seeing as there was over four dozen reported cases. They have yet to catch the monster responsible. It's nearly October and soon hundreds of the eager trick-or-treaters will fill every neighborhood street in every community. They'll go door to door innocently filling their bags with candies. Parents I'm begging you. Heed my warning. When you get home on Halloween night after taking your kids trick-or-treating, don't forget to check your child's candy. Because that monster is still out there and I'm sure he's waiting like a shark to strike. Story 11, A Father's Promise I was watching the Saints play the The Cowboys on television when my 15-year-old daughter, Grace, told me. In seven months I would be a grandfather. Initial reactions were bewilderment but were quickly followed by anger since I knew her 17-year-old boyfriend, the disgraceful slang-tongued shell of a man, would not take his newfound duties seriously. My wife, Lauren, cried and asked rhetorical questions to Grace about her money, college and shattered aspirations. My daughter was past the phase of shell-shocked, having known about her pregnancy for a month and did her best to pass her optimism to my wife and I tears fell on our carpet, as did our knees in prayer, when we huddled together and I promised to make the best of the situation and help my family in any way. Grace's boyfriend, William, surprised me by how supportive he became during the pregnancy. Late night runs to the store, learning about child development and conversations with Lauren and I became common with William. I was impressed. As Grace's belly grew so did her boyfriend's bond with our family. Rumors spread around our tight-knit community about our pregnant teenager but I knew throwing fits would only embarrass her, besides, I was getting everything a father could ask for with a grandchild and the joining of a respectable man with my daughter. We all attended church together, ate supper together and picked out items for the baby together. My promise was being kept. Nine hours of labor, and miles of nervous pacing from William and I, was what took baby Nicholas to be brought into our world. Already chubby with a head full of dark hair I knew he was destined for greatness. A senator? An attorney? Maybe a best-selling author? Nicholas' opportunities were endless as he started this world surrounded by loved ones. We took turns holding him. I have never seen Grace or Lauren so happy. William and I did our best to hide our tears of joy but failed. Nicholas, or Nick as we began to call him, was perfect. Nick and his parents lived with Lauren and I until they could develop a good financial foundation. William began working construction and Grace helped around my lawn maintenance business doing clerical work for some money. They began attending William's church, saving money and looking for homes to buy. Upset by the fact they both needed to drop out of high school, Grace began looking at the GED program and evaluating options in achieving an associate's degree at the local community college. By the time Nick was five months old my Grace had transformed from an irresponsible teenager into a loving mother who was patently focused on the future. I was getting ready for work one morning when Grace's screams pierced the silence. Screams that could sink a mountain flush with the horizon. The entire house erupted in panic and action, but we couldn't change anything. At the hospital nurses prodded my daughter and William with questions about sleeping positions even asking my wife and I about any issues involving drug use or physical abuse. Our family's responses were emotional and terse, but still the nurses had to ask. The doctors called it SIDS, something I'd never heard of before that day, and explained how rare the condition was in America. It's not rare enough. After Nick's funeral Grace and William declined into an antisocial depression. Locking themselves in their room for hours, they closed Lauren and myself out physically and emotionally. Knocks at their door went unanswered or worse. The four of us couldn't grieve together so the silence became disputes and the disputes became abusive confrontations. 
I watched my wholesome family slip through my fingers as everyone tossed blame around and vented aggressively about losing Nick. The only peace Lauren and I had was when the couple visited their church, which happened several times a week after losing their baby. Grace had become distant from me and stopped coming to work. William stopped speaking to me altogether. Lauren filled her days with pettiness and animosity. The promise I made was shriveling away before my eyes. Lauren grew tired of the virulent behavior and relented her ill will by joining William and Grace in a service of their new church. Being a deacon, I continued going to the church we had been members of for two decades, but I wasn't going to preclude my wife from mending a relationship with our daughter. Soon, they became close, even William was eager to help Lauren around the house once all three started visiting the church multiple times a week. I asked my wife about the church and she responded saying it was modern, unique and provided helpful activities to help our daughter get over the death of Nick. As a father and husband I knew a healing stage was important for the women in my life. One night, about a month after Nick's death, I woke up to sound of the back door closing. I peeked through the blinds to find William using a shovel in the backyard. Grace and Lauren stood beside him holding candles chanting a song foreign to me. I decided not to interrupt since everyone grieves differently. The last thing I wanted to do was ruin a tribute to Nick. After they made their peace they came inside and each went to their bedroom. Lauren wiped tears from her eyes as she lay down and kissed me on the forehead thinking I was asleep. Hearing Grace cry through the walls upset me but I continued to pretend I was asleep early into the morning. I hoped their secret ceremony healed my daughter's heart and brought her back into my life. I was willing to do whatever it took to keep my promise, even if that meant doing nothing. The next night I shook my wife from her sleep after hearing a faint sound. We shut off the HVAC unit and oscillating fan to cancel unwanted noise only to detect the source and rush outside. Cries from a baby, faint but audible, were emanating from the shallow hole dug by William the previous night. Choking cries pulled us to our knees before my wife and I dug our fingernails into the soil removing handfuls at a time until a feeble thin finger was exposed. It was moving. I shifted back in horror as my wife continued to throw handfuls of dirt away. Grace and William jolted out of the house right as Lauren lifted a naked infant out of the earth, screaming and begging like just out of the womb. William swaddled the newborn in a cloth printed with a winged man with a goat's head and passed the wailing child to my daughter. Lauren and William gathered around Grace while she let the baby suckle causing a silence to pass over our backyard like a fog. I got to me feet and stumbled toward my family. The infant was chubby and had a head full of dark hair. It was Nick. The three of them were uneasy when I approached. My ignorant questions were met with sympathetic stares from my wife and scoff from William. Whether baby fed a white residue should have appeared, along with the fatty white dribble from the unsucked milk, but a thick substance was in its place, the excess soaking the side of Grace's shirt into violent shades of red. Nick ate. The others coddled. I vomited what is this abomination? I yelled at my loved ones as they brushed dirt from Nick's hair it is mercy for our good faith. William blasted back honey, Grace and Nick have another chance, Lauren said holding back tears I don't understand. How did this happen? Her, Grace said looking past me. I turned and inside the threshold of our back door, obstructed by darkness, stood a tall woman who was nude, skinny, and appeared to have a disease of the skin. Black hair flowed past her hips and she slightly leaned her weight side to side as if swaying to music only she could hear. Her head was misshapen and her eyes had sunk so far into her skull they appeared as holes. Her dry lips split and cracked as she opened her mouth to reveal a dozen voices speaking simultaneously soul for a soul. I turned to my family. Lauren was sobbing and mouthing I love you. William stared at the woman smiling. Grace kissed Nick on the head before turning toward me dad, Grace said, this was the only way. You promised you would do anything to help us. You promised. I nodded and wiped away tears may I have some time? I asked the woman. She nodded and sunk back into the shadows of my home. That was one week ago. After everything that happened my mind still doesn't process it, but I can't argue with reality when I hold my grandson in the palms of my hands. 
Members from William's church have visited often since the rebirth of Nick. They have held him more than me. Lauren is proud and I have never seen Grace so happy. However, every day since the woman appeared Nick has gotten sicker. What started as a small rash grew into a cough, then a fever, so I know the clock is ticking for me to give myself up. Soul for a soul. Nicholas' opportunities are endless as he starts this world surrounded by loved ones. I rocked my grandson to sleep last night. He is perfect. Tonight my tears fell on the carpet, as did my knees in prayer, when I promised to make the best of the situation and help my family in any way. I made up my mind that tomorrow will be the night I keep my promise.